Hi, I am Rahil Philippos and you are listening to 3 Things the Indian Express News Show. It's currently February and temperatures in some parts of the country are already touching 40 degrees Celsius. Over the past week, maximum temperatures have been 5 to 11 degrees Celsius higher than normal in most parts of northern and western India. And places like Rajasthan, Gujarat and Maharashtra have been particularly hot. But the biggest deviation from normal has been seen in states like Himachal and Uttarakhand where temperatures are generally much lower this time of the year. But these states are now experiencing heat wave like conditions. And this is even affecting food production. Farmers, particularly those who grow wheat, are facing a lot of issues because of it. Now to understand the reasons behind this unusual rise in temperatures, we first speak to the Indian Express's Amitabh Sinha and then we talk to the Indian Express's rural affairs editor Harish Damodaran who explains how this rising temperature has affected the wheat production in the country. So Amitabh it's so strange it almost feels like we all woke up one morning and suddenly it was summer. The temperatures have risen considerably in the last couple of days. Isn't it quite unusual to see these temperatures this early in the year? Okay so you are right uh, it's almost a very abrupt end to the winter and a very sudden start to summer at least in uh, some parts of the country not the entire country but some part of the country there has been a very abrupt change also somewhat unusually high temperatures almost touching 40 degrees in some parts but this is what is happening as of now it seems like sort of a temporary phase dictated by mostly a couple of local factors coming together and uh, it's likely to peter out in a few days time in fact uh, i guess temperatures would have dropped a little bit and it's likely unlikely to go up in the next few days that's what the india met department has been saying so you mentioned local factors what exactly are we dealing with here yes so the general impression these days when you talk about warmer temperatures hot weather is global warming manifesting itself so immediately our first thing is oh these are the effects of climate change and it is not entirely incorrect but when that general trend gets further aggravated by some sort of local conditions you know some atmospheric some meteorological conditions few of them coinciding happening at the same time then we see these kind of some abnormal things happening with that are not expected during this time of the year and uh, usually in the month of february you do see some amount of showers in some parts of the country in north northwest mainly due to you know what is called the western disturbance it's a reference to some wind systems coming from northwest now those kind of showers have not happened this year in february so that is one reason then imd talks about one anticyclonic event that is taking place off the coast of gujarat that is adding a layer of heat in the lower atmosphere also the imd has talked about a slower than usual sea breeze and uh, usually if you have ample amount of air coming over from the sea it has a general cooling effect but the sea breezes have been observed to be slightly slower than usual this year which is complicating things especially on the maharashtra coastline and uh, the temperatures there also we have seen ratnagiri i think was almost touching 40 2 3 days ago so these are some of the reasons that imd has been giving these are essentially local factors working on the the general trend of global warming that we are seeing in any case right and amitabh some of the biggest deviations have been recorded in states like himachal and uttarakhand now these are states that are known to be cooler around this time of the year right and now they're recording heat waves Has the IMD offered any explanation on why these states in particular are being affected? Yes, so I mean some part of this effect of the anticyclone of the Gujarat coast also the slowing of the breeze that effect is getting passed on further you know in the northwestern states that's all the IMD has said there might be other things also that might be playing a role in Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh but that's all that we know from IMD as of now. So another big weather phenomenon that's likely to affect temperatures and rainfall is this transition from La Niña to El Niño. Could you first explain these two weather phenomena? 
So Ladina and El Nino phenomena, they are talked about very frequently. They are actually, one is the mirror image of the other. The Ladina and El Nino phenomenon together called the ENSO situation, E-N-S-C-O. So basically, in very simple terms, there is a part of equatorial Pacific Ocean off the coast of uh, Peru and Chile in South America, around that area. So there is this large part of Pacific Ocean. Uh, the surface waters over that ocean periodically gets sometimes hotter and sometimes becomes cooler than what is normal. And, you know, these alternate. So once you have an El Nino and then there is a neutral phase and then La Nina occurs and then back to neutral and then El Nino. And this is a very large level. It's a very macro sort of atmospheric phenomenon because of which it impacts weather events across the world, not just in India, across the world, weather events are influenced by this El Nino. So, Amitabh, can you tell us how this transition from La Nina to El Nino will affect India in particular? So, over India, what the result in is uh, the monsoon rainfall is known to get a bit suppressed when El Nino phenomenon happens. When there is an El Nino happening in the Pacific Ocean, wherein the waters are slightly warmer, then that leads to a slight suppression of the monsoon rainfall. During La Nina phase, the monsoon gets a, a little bit of encouragement from La Nina. Now, uh, for the last three years, there has been this La Nina that currently prevails in the Pacific Ocean that has been carrying on for the last three years. It is the strongest and the longest persisting La Nina ever for as long as we have measured. It's a very strong La Nina that has been happening. Now it's getting into a weak phase and the prediction is that it will turn into neutral and possibly develop into a slightly, some El Nino might develop towards the uh, latter half of the year. Now, the direct correlation that a lot of people are making is that because the La Nina would end, probably it would result in lower rainfall during monsoon. But that conclusion, in fact, would be a little premature because we are not immediately entering into an El Nino phase. At least it's not predicted as of now, number one. And number two, even if there is an El Nino, it does not mean that the monsoon has to be bad. And La Nina is supposed to have a general cooling effect over the entire globe. So it cools down the Earth's atmosphere a little bit. As a result of which, what we have seen is that global temperatures, and we have talked about the global warming. So the extent of global warming for the last two years had been suppressed a little bit because of this cooling effect that, you know, La Nina produces. So that's the other impact that's being talked about, that if La Nina now ends, as any phase would end after a point of time, there is this possibility that is being discussed that this year we might see slightly hotter weather. So that's the other consequence. That's the other thing that has been discussed about in relation to La Nina. Okay, but Amitabh, it almost seems as if as far as the weather is concerned, now abnormal is the new normal. Suddenly, overly cold winters, intense heat waves, those are the new norm, right? Yeah, so that's one very definite way in which climate change is manifesting itself. We're not very sure about whether rainfall would happen or how hot the summers would be. What we definitely know is that increasingly, and we are experiencing it, and all of us have experienced it, and from our own empirical experiences, we can say that weather systems in general are getting more and more unpredictable. What we were used to, at least people who are older than, say, 20, 25 years of age, they had a certain notion about what kind of weather to expect during what time of the year. And those notions, our own experiences over the years, they are getting challenged by what we are seeing these days. And a lot of that has to do with climate change. So I think we need to accept the fact that going forward, these things would get increasingly erratic. Weather would be increasingly erratic and 40 degrees in February would not be something that we need to be completely surprised at. Or even a 32 degrees in December is not something that we have to be surprised at. It Weather is going to play much more truant. And this is one of the very direct things that we experience as a result of climate change. So we probably do not need to be surprised about these things any longer. So now we know why abnormal is the new normal, at least as far as the weather is concerned. But next, we talk about how this rise in temperature is also making farmers concerned, particularly those who cultivate wheat. 
Wheat, which is perhaps the most important crop for India, has become the first crop to be affected by climate change. Last year, the crop burned during the final stage of its production because of a sudden rise in temperatures in March. And the farmers are worried that they will face the same issue this year as well because of an unusually hot February. So keeping these worries in mind, the scientists at the Indian Council of Agricultural Research have found a solution. They've developed a new variety of wheat that isn't affected by this kind of weather. To know more about the concerns as well as this new variety, my colleague Ucha Sarman speaks to Harish Damodran. Well, Harish, before we get into this new variety, could you explain how this rise in temperature impacts the wheat crop? Yeah, see, wheat in India is basically a winter spring crop. So you sow during winter and you harvest after the spring is over, early April onwards. Now, what is happening in India is that you have winter, but there is no spring. Winter is giving transitioning straight to summer. So there are no spring breaks. And this entire thing has been disrupting the wheat crop in the last few years. And we saw it most clearly last year. Till around mid-March, the wheat was growing beautifully. I mean, there was absolutely no problem. And the crop looked good. But you suddenly had a surge in temperatures from mid-March. And that happened in the last stage of the crop. The last stage of the crop is basically when the grain is being formed and it is getting filled. So when I say filling, filling is precisely the period when the grain starts accumulating starch, protein and other nutrients. And that is a period when the maximum temperatures should not exceed about, say, 35 degrees. So that the wheat that is uh, harvested, the grains are filled, you know, and towards the end, when the temperatures cross 35 degrees, by then, basically, what would have happened is uh, the wheat would have been properly formed, the grains would have hardened, and farmers are then able to harvest the grain, which is fully dry. And that's how it happens. But what we have been seeing in the past few years is, you know, for temperatures to suddenly rise in March. And therefore, uh, the grain filling doesn't happen properly. And what you get is basically very low yields. That's what has been happening. And this year, what we are seeing is we are seeing temperatures rise not in March, in February itself. So obviously, this is race concerns whether we are going to have a repeat of last year or maybe even worse. And last year, we had some stocks, you know, we had good stocks, whereas uh, this year, the government doesn't have that much of stock. So I think uh, this year is going to be more tricky than last year. I think that is why the whole concern is about that if there is no spring and winters, uh, you know, transition straight to summer, there will be a problem. It raises questions about the future of wheat crop in India. And that is where science comes in. Yeah, now keeping these concerns in mind, uh, the scientists at the Indian Council of Agricultural Research seem to have found a solution. Could you talk about what that solution is? So now what the scientists are trying to say is that, uh, look, if temperatures are going to rise in March, so why don't we do one thing? Why don't we try and beat the heat by sowing in October instead of November? So what they are trying to do is to develop wheat varieties, which can be sown from, say, around October 20th onwards. So which means basically 10 days earlier. So if you sow 10 days earlier, then the wheat is ready to be harvested 10 days earlier. So which means that the grain filling can happen when temperatures haven't started really rising, crossing 35 degrees, you know, and sort of uh, drying up the crop. And that's the solution which uh, scientists at ICAR are trying to do. But it's not easy because if you sow normal wheat crops in, say, October 20th or something, what happens is that the same wheat will tend to flower much earlier, which is not desirable because what is required is that the wheat should continue to grow for a long time before it starts flowering. So there should be a long period for the roots, for the stem, for the leaves, etc. to grow, what is called the vegetative stage. The longer the vegetative period, the better for the crop later on, when it will start flowering and when it will start producing the grain. So with normal varieties, if I sow in October, the flowering will also happen earlier. So what you will have is uh, you won't have very good yields as a result. And have the scientists found a way around this problem? Yeah. So what the ICR scientists have done is you breed certain varieties which have what they call as a mild vernalization requirement. Vernalization is basically the need for the crop to have a certain minimum days of 
low temperatures, without a certain minimum days of chilling, the crop will simply not flower. So what will happen is, so in a regular wheat crop, if it takes, say, 80 days for flowering to be initiated here, it will take about, say, 100 days for the flowering to start. And if the flowering, even if it takes place, say, 20 days later, the flowering will still start happening by early February itself. And the entire grain filling will be finished by, say, around March 20th, March 25th itself. Then it doesn't matter whether the temperatures shoot up or, you know, whether you will have uh, early summer or something. And the farmer is able to then harvest the wheat, which is uh, fully mature and with good yields. And I think that is what the scientists have done now with these new wheat varieties. And this can actually beat the heat. Okay, so the scientists have essentially developed a variety which can be planted a lot earlier when the temperatures aren't that high. But do we know when can this variety be used by farmers across the country? So what they have done is this particular variety, they have registered with the Plant Varieties Protection Authority and then they have licensed it to a private company, which is basically DCM Sriram, which is happening for the first time where a public institute, uh, sort of they breed the variety and then they give it out to a private seed company for commercialization and multiplication. So that will expedite the process of, you know, lab to land kind of a transfer and which is happening for the first time you know so i think we need more such uh, public private partnership in the days to come and if that happens then the benefits will go to the farmer also and probably the seed companies can pay some kind of a royalty maybe say one rupee per kg or something for every kg of seed that they market and that money can be uh, plowed back into research and today the icr system is very much required you know i mean to breed uh, uh, varieties especially you know which are climate resilient and wheat is probably the first crop in India which is seeing the effects of uh, climate change. We are having winters, but no spring and straight away it is uh, summer. So maybe this is a model which can be, you know, replicated across many other crops. And especially in agriculture research, you know, we need ICAR, we need the state agriculture universities who can do the basic research and the basic breeding. And for commercialization and the seed multiplication, that can be done by the private sector. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was hosted, written and produced by Ucha Sarmin and me, Rahil Filipos, with the help of Shashank Bhargav. It was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at the rate indianexpress.com. 